eight and three for the first time in 26 years, but a negative point differential. What are the Cleveland Browns? We'll find out this weekend. Huge, potentially large game with Tennessee and Kyler Murray versus Aaron Donald with this panel. Let's go. That begins in my line, Tony. Huge, potentially large. The line Israel Gutierrez said 10 years ago, and I'm still muting him for it. Montclair, New Jersey in the house. NFL Week 13 Browns, Titans, the featured matchup. Eight and three versus eight and three. Cleveland's eight and three for the first time in 26 years, but have been outscored by 21 points this season and one win versus a team with a winning record. You people talk about must wins all the time. Is this a <laughs> must win for Cleveland to be taken seriously? Around the horn to Frank Isola. You know, I'll go along with that. And you're talking about a minus 21 point differential. When they played Pittsburgh two months ago, it was a minus 31 point differential. So the last time they played a Super Bowl contending type of team, they got absolutely smoked. And their quarterback, Baker Mayfield, was 10 of 18. He did not play well. So, sure, why not? Go out there, win a game like this. I get it. You're 8 and 3. They could use a quality Israel win. Israel Gutierrez, a must win to be taken seriously for the Browns? No. And being taken seriously, it is not equal being a Super Bowl contender, especially if you're the Cleveland Browns. All they need to be thought of is as a playoff team. And at 8 and 3, they now have a 78% chance of making the playoffs. What we're looking at when we were criticizing them, other than the point differential, is how they're winning, right? Because last year we had this expectation through the roof with all these talent around, and including Baker Mayfield uh, supposedly flourishing in his second year. Now what you have a team is when they do win, just finding a way to win, using that running game, using Baker Mayfield less, and he still shows his inaccuracies. But if this was, let's say, Alex Smith leading this team, we'd say, wow, that guy knows how to win. It doesn't matter that they're middle of the pack in DVOA and offense and defense defense and very okay. bad in special teams. This team just finds a way to get the W. So do they have to win this? No. They are still on path to being a better coach team and a team that won't lose all the games that they lost before and still make the play. Okay. So, and in there, you were saying Baker Mayfield's been hyper-criticized. I think, if I'm picking up what you're putting down here, you think Baker Mayfield's been hyper-criticized this season. If he wasn't the number one pick, obviously, we wouldn't be this critical of him. So all eyes have been on him. And meanwhile, they're 8-3, and three, and they're not doing it because of him. They're doing it in spite of him. We'll bring in Emily Kaplan here on the question. Is it a must-win game to be taken seriously? Browns over Titans here. I already take them seriously. They've played this year without their best wide receiver, their best running back, and their best pass rusher for a periods of time. And I will be critical of Baker Mayfield. He's been mediocre. And they still have their first winning season since 2007. But most importantly than that, we're at this point of the season and ownership hasn't interfered and there's been no offseason drama. In Cleveland, that's like kind of celebrating a Super Bowl. So yes, this is an important game, but I'm more interested when they play the Steelers and the Ravens the second time around because they lost to those guys 76 to 13 combined. And if you need want to be taken seriously in the NFC North, you got to beat the NFC North. Did Emily get ahead of herself just a little bit? Did you call it a winning season? They're eight and three. Eight wins is not a winning win. season Matt. just yet. It's just you got to get over eight wins or a tie at some point. Clint Yates, how about you? Yeah, it's another one of those situations, though, where I'm not going to criticize a team for beating bad teams. That's what you're supposed yeah. to do in the NFL. The Browns are not easy to beat. They run that cover three with that bend and don't break. They get down, down into the red zone, and they turn them over, or they pick them off. I mean, it's something that's effective. If you told me they were going to be in this position after losing all the weapons they had, I would have said you're nuts. However, as a result of the fact that that's not the case, I do take them seriously. They don't need this win in order to establish themselves as anything. They figured out how to get it done, and it's working. Whether or not that's going to take them to the AFC championship game or not, I don't know. But this is progress as far as I'm concerned considering what happened. I've got a question for the rest of the panel. Do you believe Clinton Yates more when he's breaking down defensive strategy because he's got a pencil on his left hand? Do you believe him more yeah. because of that pencil? What are you What are you writing on now? Now you've switched it to your right hand. Uh, Frank Isola on the idea that Baker's been too criticized this season. I, I think there's a lot of truth to that, but it's justifiable when you're the number one overall pick. That's going to happen. You come into the league, you expect guys to be great right away. Let's give Kevin Stefanski a lot of credit, the coach here who nobody ever talks about. And by the way, his dad used to work for the Nets when Jason Kidd was there during the offseason. Okay. Kevin that, Stefanski that, that, that's had Jason Kidd. Hang on. About this. He had Jason Kidd talk to the team. Provide, you know, they need leadership there. And I think Baker's oh, he had Jason Kidd talk to this Browns team. All right. All right. Fine. 
Let me get it out. Israel Gutierrez, I apologize. This is Cleveland, obviously, so this is important just for perspective. The last time this team made the playoffs, LeBron James was still in high school, okay? It was 2002. That's been a long time. Expectations are way too high last year. Settle down, make the playoffs. They're still on path to be the team that hopefully Cleveland So the feature matchup of this week comes with Tennessee beginning to round into the team that made a postseason run. Who do you like in this game, Clinton Yates? I like the Titans. I just think they're too strong, and that run game rips off too many big shots, I think, Emily for the Browns Kaplan. to be able to actually win it. I like the Titans with Derrick Henry scoring three touchdowns and Nick Chubb scoring two. Okay. And how about you, Israel Gutierrez? <laughs> I'm going to take the Browns. I, you look at that running game and say, okay, they have more to prove, it seems like. The t Tennessee has been up and down a little bit this year. I'm going to say Cleveland takes this. Right, guys, Sola. Tennessee, last two games, has rushed for at least 170 yards. I think it'll be Tennessee. We'll move on. Rams, Cardinals. Another. <laughs> matchup to put the spotlight on here both coming in off crash back down to earth losses wheels have kind of fallen off of Kyler Murray and the Cardinals offense but Murray specifically in the sense that he's not running and you can see right there the Arizona Republic putting Cliff Kingsbury in the crosshairs and now they get Aaron Donald as for the Rams Sean McVay quotes our quarterback has to take better care of the football end quote Clinton Yates, how much of Sunday is on Kyla Murray? How much is on Cliff Kingsbury? How much is on Jared Goff? A lot's on Jared Goff, but luckily for the Rams, Jared Goff plays extremely well against the Cardinals in the Vance Joseph defense. Five picks in the last, excuse me, five touchdowns in the last two games, no picks. He's only gotten sacked twice. This is the team he actually does it against. But overall, I think people are overlooking how difficult this Rams defense is to deal with, not just because of the line, but because of the secondary. You recall that game against the Seahawks. Muscle Wilson was afraid to go to DK because they were picking everything off and they were knocking everything down. So if they can put him in a situation, as in Kyler, in a situation like that with Hopkins, he's going to be running around a lot and it's going to be very difficult. Right. So I think that it's primarily on golf, but Kyler has a lot to do with it. So you're saying Jalen Ramsey can solve DeAndre Hopkins and that makes everything easier when you're going up against uh, the Cardinals. Emily Kaplan, Kyler Murray's last couple of games doesn't seem to be moving as much. Cliff Kingsbury's play call and play decisions have been called into, into question. And, and then on the other side of the ball, Goff has been called out by his coach. What's the story this week? I think there's a lot of pressure on Kingsbury. He's been the darling of the NFL ever since we saw him at the draft, sitting in his mansion lair, looking like American Psycho. Then he starts the season off 5-2, and two, and everyone's like, wow, this guy's the next big thing. Well, you know what? His team's been really mediocre lately. They had 20 more plays than the Patriots last week, managed to lose that game. The Patriots and the Seahawks both could maintain and contain Kyler Murray in the pocket. And once they took the run game out of him, the offense wasn't special. So this guy is supposed to be an offensive genius. It's on him to get this team back on track. They would be 0-4 in their last four if it wasn't for the Hail Mary Murray. Mm -hmm. It's Rick Gutierrez. The Hail Murray. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, think it was, I think it's more on Murray and Kingsbury than it is on Goff. And the reason is because is I think for a lot of people, the jury's already out on Jared Goff. They think he won't be uh, one of the best quarterbacks. I didn't say elite. One of the uh, best yes, quarterbacks in the league. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it. At some point. Um, but I think with Kyler Murray, there's still that, that chance, right? And the way they started off the first half of the season, you look and say, wow, what's happening to this team? Whether it be the quarterback who can't seem to get out of the pocket, can't seem to run enough or whether it be the play calling that needs to be the change especially for this game as Clinton pointed out this is a difficult Rams defense this play calling and your quarterback the ability at that position has to be what differentiates it for you more so than Jared Goff would for the Rams. Frank Isola. Let's also remember Arizona against New England had a chance to take the lead their kicker missed a very makeable kick and they allowed Cam Newton to go into scoring position and for the Patriots to win that game. My only thing about Jared Goff, and I know he's getting a lot of criticism, I believe you can win a Super Bowl with him. I don't think he's going to be one of the top quarterbacks in the league. But remember this. The last two times they won a game against Seattle, against Tampa, two pretty good teams, he was a combined 66 for 88. Those are pretty good numbers. Their running game isn't what it once was, and teams are daring Jared Goff to beat them. Now, four interceptions the last two weeks isn't good but I still think you could win with Well, him. getting called out by your coach in that manner that he did, not mentioning his name, mentioning, well, our quarterback's got to play. That's, yeah. that's something, too. Clinton, something you want to add? 
Right, and that's something McVay's been doing multiple times this season. You remember against, you know, he's talking about got other quarterbacks the same way, but also the Cardinals are still kind of ahead of schedule. The Rams are moving backwards, so this is absolutely as important for the Rams, mm, specifically no. golf, because of that reason precisely. Well, they're moving backwards, but they're, they're moving backwards and forward. It's like a horse race with them. They're going back and forth, back and forth, because two weeks ago, someone on this panel said they're the best team in the, the NFC. Bill Plaschke's not here to wear that mute right Bill now. Bill Plaschke. Uh, I thought it was Frank. Uh, no, it wasn't Frank. Uh, make a pick in this matchup, Frank. I solo. who you got, Cardinals or Rams? Rams are winning this game. It's real. I'm going to say the Rams also. Emily? I like the Rams, but I don't think Tyler is 100%. Ben Yates. Baseball player Kyler Murray is going to pull this one out for the Cardinals. Taking a break right here. Buy or sell is next. Where we'll be buying and or selling a certain story from a certain reporter. We're buying or selling you, Emily Kaplan. I know your sister is right off camera. Let's bring Eva Kaplan on the show to buy or sell Emily Kaplan. <laughs> buy or sell. Steven Silas, new head coach of the Houston Rockets, says he's giving James Harden some space. Are any of you guys in need of space? Here, Frank Isola, I'll give you some space right now. <laughs> Yesterday, the panel was split on whether the Westbrook wall trade made it more likely Harden would demand the trade or not more likely that he would go through with demanding a trade. Clinton Yates, buy or sell space. I'll buy this. You know how I feel about relationship advice on this show, and I've seen this before. He's saying to him, baby, come back. You can blame it all on me because he knows that the Rockets got nothing without that guy in terms of what they can sell going forward. They've convinced everybody that it's worth it to deal with James Harden, so they want him, and they're not going to do anything to make sure that they mess if that there up. there was anybody quoting idea. baby, come back from 35 years ago, I would not have had you, Clinton Yates. Emily Kaplan. Yeah, I'm buying this approach. Everything we understand about James Harden being disgruntled involves things that are either above Steven Silas or before Steven Silas. So when you're dealing with a petulant teenager, you don't have to like, approach him in the middle of his temper tantrum. You wait for him to cool off, give space, then you go and play good cop. And now parenting advice from Emily Kaplan on this show. Israel <laughs> Gutierrez, buy or sell space no, here in, in this, this situation. Mm -hmm. In this situation, Tony, I don't think the answer is space because you're just giving them time to sort of get more of a wandering eye to say, hey, that team looks pretty good over there. That's What you need to do is find a way to create space for him on the floor. You need to get him in the echo chamber of the Houston Rockets practice facility and say, man, look how good John Wall looks. Look how motivated Boogie Cousins is. And then get him saying, okay, if it's good enough for Giannis to stay with a team that w didn't win a championship, it's good enough for me. Let's give this a run. Frank Isola? It sounds like a euphemism, giving him his space for he's ghosting us. We can't get a hold of him. And I feel badly for Stephen Silas. <laughs> I've known him a long time. But let's face it, Harden is doing exactly what Kawhi did and with San Antonio and what Anthony Davis did with New Orleans. He's holding the organization hostage until he gets traded. And guess what? It worked out for Anthony Davis <laughs> and Kawhi. They got their money and they won titles. So what are you going to do? Here's the way. There's always a way to get space on this show, right? This is how we do it. Now I can, now I can breathe a little bit. That's the relationship that I want. We'll move on. Buy or sell, too. It's not championship or bust for the Milwaukee Bucks. Quote, championship or bust? Certainly not the way we approached it. We embraced competition. That's Budenholzer. There's that. And there's also whether it's super max or bust for Giannis. The deadline is December 21. Emily, not championship or bust? I honestly don't know why the coach said this except to temper expectations for his own performance. When you have the league MVP, you make significant moves to put talent around the league MVP. The league MVP says his number one priority is winning a championship and can walk away in two years. How is it not championship or bust? Israel Gutierrez? It was this close to being championship or bust last year. It was just a little bit more busty for LeBron and AD. So, um, yeah, it's absolutely championship or bust. This is something that a coach has to say, especially a coach who would be potentially on the hot seat if they don't win a championship. Yeah, it's absolutely put, uh, championship or bust. Otherwise, Giannis would have Wait, but you think uh, he extension. has to say it's not championship? If everyone, I don't want to put words in Frank or Clinton's mouth, everyone agrees it's championship or bust. Why do you think he doesn't have to say that? I don't think he doesn't have to say it. Um, I think that when a coach can't say that, I think a coach cannot put all that type of pressure on themselves, even though he knows what the truth Frank is. Frank Isola, where are you on this? Th that's where he should set the bar. I think they just have to get to an NBA Finals. That, to me, 
is the minimum right now for the Milwaukee Bucks. Winning a championship, they'll probably play LeBron. That will be hard. But I do think that Giannis will sign that extension by December 21st. I think that will happen. Do you believe it's super max or bust for this franchise, Frank? I do. And remember this, too. They're 5-9 and nine in their last 14 playoff games. Some of that falls on Giannis. If he's going to be the star, some of it falls Clinton on Giannis. Yates. Yeah, it absolutely should be championship or bust for both sides involved. And there's nothing wrong with that. This is the closest I've seen this franchise get to anything close to the top in my lifetime. And Giannis is a generational player. This is a reasonable bar to set. And I like it from Boots, for sure. Buy or sell three, NHL restart. Emily, you wrote today that the NHL is now aiming for a mid-January start date with a 52 or 56 game schedule at best. Also, there's a report out there. Could outdoor ice be the answer? Right now we're here in Boston. Just looking at Fenway Park, LA at the Galaxy Stadium. Who should we start with here in this report? Well, let's start with Israel Gutierrez. <laughs> Buy or sell what Emily Kaplan's selling? Well, as a, as a non-purist, I know that's shocking to you. I am a fan of more outdoor games. I don't know if that upsets other people, but I do think it would be interesting, even if it's just for a season and an odd season as it, as it will be. What I'm concerned about is just the fragility of these leagues and the fact that I am buying them having to try everything possible to get as many fans in whatever setting they have, because otherwise, man, these leagues are going to suffer. The fragility of these leagues and the frigidity of these leagues as well, I guess, if they're playing outdoor ice. Frank, I still have a very good. Uh, I like all of it. I like the fact that Emily's working. I like the fact that they're going to play outside <laughs> wait, in the winter sport. And I like about 50 <laughs> games per season. I'm all for it. As opposed to what exactly? Uh, how about you, Yates? <laughs> I like the 50 game element coming off what they did. That seems to make sense to me, but there's something just a little hokey about playing all games outdoors that I don't love and it just doesn't oh, feel right. Stop. I'm as big a fan of the NHL as everybody else, but I'm kind of bummed that they're in this hokey. We just played an entire season with a bubble. I mean, is that hokey as well? Emily Kaplan. All right, everyone I talk to says that these games outdoors are probably not going to happen for many reasons, but let's just look at the big picture here. Right before the pandemic, Harry Bettman was boasting that the league was healthier than ever, and there's no reason to believe that they won't be on that trajectory again, especially with a new TV deal coming in 2021 and Seattle coming in. They just need to push through the next few months. The problem is a lot of owners don't want to push through the next few months, and they've asked owners to reopen their financial agreement. So before we even talk about all of this, we have to have a labor agreement, and we all know in the NHL they don't have the best track okay. record for that. So before before we even get into a conversation about this, there needs to be a conversation about something else. This just seems like you want to have like more conversations about NHL on this show. Maybe we'll do that yes. in Showdown. The worst thing? Yeah. Yes. For Izzy it. wants it. Just read my story. Clinton wants it. <laughs> Frank wants me to talk. You don't about think it. they would be open to playing at Fenway Park and the Galaxy Stadium and some of these other great stadia outdoors? That's a great idea. Great idea. Man. All right. Clint Yates, not to Clinton. Not Frank Isola, you can argue outdoors right now. Why don't you I've go? been to an outdoor game, Frank. Have you? Kaplan All Gutierrez, right. showdown. Two minutes. Thanks. Emily Kaplan, Israel Gutierrez, good luck in showdown. Texas high school football. Here's the video going around. It's not good. Playoff game yesterday, a student ejected from the game, coming back onto the field and tackling the referee. And today, the school district of Edinburgh High School removed the team from the playoffs. Removing the team for that player's infraction, is that a fair punishment, Emily? You know, watching this incident is disturbing, but I was also disturbed to hear that there was a similar incident between the same player and a referee in a soccer season last year. And so while, yes, we need to teach our kids sportsmanship and accountability, this really seems like an isolated incident, and they really should have removed this kid from the football season and not punished his teammates for the entire year. Yeah, my initial thought there... Sorry, my initial thought there was that, hey, it is fair to punish the entire team because of this incident. But when you listen and you hear there was the incident last year, it just kind of makes you wonder, especially with high school age students really controlling those emotions of that many students. You never really know, you know, what can happen. And so to punish everybody for one player's actions, I think is a bit of a problem. I know if I was a parent of one of those uh, children still on the, on the team, I'd be upset about that's, it. They won, that's tough. They had a chance to move on in the playoffs. Incredibly tough. It would be upsetting to me. I want to know what happens now. How do you work with this player, with this student, now that we have, as you said, Emily, a history? How do we move forward with the student in what looks like issues on the field and better him in some way? 
Thanks for your thoughts on that. Let's get to showdown one here. The hole in the Mayakoba Classic. And I'm not talking about the hole you're trying to hit it into. I'm talking about the hole into the center of the earth that doubles as a trap. <laughs> I mean, that's like to a different dimension. Israel, are you for or against more extreme hazards in the PGA? In the PGA, yes. I mean, that thing scares the heck out of me. Like, I feel like I want to watch a PGA player just kind of hit off the edge there and maybe sort of tinker with falling in. But I'm from Florida. I see sinkholes here. I don't want to yeah. see that on my golf course. It would frighten me. Tone, you know the answer here. Light the balls on fire, play 18, and last <laughs> ball that goes out, they win. That's, that's been my, that's been my uh, MO all along. Uh, should you win, two words or fewer, what would you be talking about, Emily? Uh, the NHL. I course. knew it. In Israel, how about you? Uh, Poppy Lebetard. Oh, of course. Israel Gutierrez, FaceTime, please. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. And we've heard news about Dan Lebetard not continuing at ESPN starting in January. And that includes his father, Poppy Lebetard, who I was so lucky to work next to, a man who has a master's degree in, in, in industrial engineering and who is answering a phone that looked like a banana and making people across the country laugh. It was an honor to work next to him for so many years. That's why you're wearing the banana shirt today. It is. It is. Yeah. Pick it Love up. Poppy. See you Monday.